everybody, welcome to Screen Heroes episode 115. I am Derek, one of your regular hosts. I've got my two other regular hosts with me, Ryan. Hello. And Ray. Hi. And this week we're going to be talking about our favorite practical effects in film. And we also have some news that we're going to cover too. So let's kick things off. Avengers has made a lot of money. So much money. Big surprise. <laughs> My God. So there's been like a ton of things that the Russos have come out and confirmed. James Gunn confirmed that uh, uh, Groot's last word translated into dad. Spoiler alert, by the way, if you haven't seen the movie. Dad. Dad. He was talking to Rocket. Um, it's funny because at the beginning... Vin Diesel got two scripts, one that just said, I am Groot, and the other that said the translation, so he had some emotional context. And then by the second one, they dialed back the I am Groot, and now for Infinity War, he, he just got the regular script of what all the translation is, and he just said, I am Groot, over and over again. So he, he can now translate in his head, Wow, which is kind of cool. Not that Groot's a very difficult language. <laughs> and since Thor speaks Groot, uh, so he knows what the last word was. Yes. So, I mean, Thor does. Hemsworth might not, but Thor does. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> <laughs> well, Thor is also recently orphaned, so there might be some, you know, resonance there. Y yeah. I'm not, I don't know. It's a little different because Thor was like, you know a multi-thousand-year-old adult when his dad died of old age versus, <laughs> True. you know. So. His dad, Obi-Wan Kenobi, okay? We're not quite sure if he, no, like, he died, but he just faded away because he was tired of No, we shit. call that Luke Skywalker now. <laughs> that's, that's what we need a new name for it. Or the tortoise from Kung Fu Panda, who did it. Oh, uh, yeah. I don't think, I don't think that's what we call it. but It was beautiful. It was something special. Fantastic. So, yeah, so Avengers has been doing very well at the box office. It broke a billion dollars faster than any other movie ever has, um, pulling in uh, over $100 million in its second week. I'm pulling up the numbers here. 114.7 in its second week. So, you know, better in its second week than most movies ever do on their opening weekend. Crazy. So its total now is just about $1.2 So by the time you're listening to this, it'll be past $1.2 I would imagine. People are questioning, is it going to make $2 billion? I don't think so. I don't but, I mean, it'll make a lot. It'll make it over has, $1.5 probably. If it has the staying power that Black Panther did, yeah, it might. I don't think it does. It had a 55% but... drop in the second week, which, yeah. is, which is by no means like a significant thing. But it is a good size drop, whereas like Black Panther stayed... I think a lot of people went to go see it multiple times opening weekend, and That's maybe they're not point. seeing it, you know, mm -hmm. throughout the theater run. So, yeah, That's I mean, a it's a, it had a pretty standard drop in its second week, like what you would anticipate for a movie versus like Black Panther and Wonder Woman. People just kind of kept going yeah. um, as people heard more and more about it. So, you know, it it's definitely got an interesting split. It's almost sixty forty foreign and domestic for its numbers, which is also what you would kind of expect. So it's pretty much tracking exactly what everyone anticipated it would. Um, I think it has a good shot to get close to $2 billion. Uh, Some movies have done it. I think there's three other movies we talked about that have done it. Uh, so, you know, there's a good shot that it will, but it's early. You know, if it has another... If it can be at like 80-something million next weekend, then, you know, we know it's going to just kind of keep trucking along. Right, it's, it's got a good shot. Mm -hmm. So, but totally. yeah, we still don't exactly know what the movie cost. That's been kind of going back and forth. But we know it was expensive. But it, yeah. whether or not it was the most expensive, we're we're not really sure. So. so, Agents of Shield has confirmed that they're going to tie in. They've already acknowledged Thanos well, they on the last episode. Yeah, and they're they're gonna do the thing. They actually said something about it. Like, there was a really, really slight reference to it the week before, and then this week it was a point of conversation, which is interesting because uh, they actually just introduced the most powerful person probably in the Marvel Universe. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I'm curious to see, you know... I, 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 Squirrel Girl finally showed up? No, <laughs> in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, oh, I guess I should okay. say. Um, 
you know, part of me being a fan of Agents of Shield and and uh, the movies wonders what the what difference there would have been if he had been there in this case. But uh, you know, I don't think it would have mattered in the long run. But he is significantly more powerful than pretty much all the Avengers. So it's pretty intense considering how powerful like Thor is. And... Yeah, yeah. Like I'm pretty sure he could take Thor out of the equation. <laughs> Maybe not Hulk. I don't know. Hulk is weird. We don't know his power scaling in the That's cinematic true. universe. But it seems a little inconsistent yeah. in the MCU. Which, like I he mean, got knocked out by Thanos, but like in the comic books, when he gets angry, he just gets more strong and more powerful. I mean, I guess he's been knocked out in the comic books too, mm-hmm. but... Uh, his his power set's always kind of inconsistent because yeah. like the Flash basically yeah exactly he's as strong as he him. needs to be versus the Flash is just as fast as the episode calls for right you know um, at least like the Hulk movie doesn't start with I'm Bruce Banner and I'm the strongest man alive that's true <laughs> that's true um, so other Marvel news but not MCU is Deadpool um, 2 is coming out soon and they announced that T.J. Miller will not be back for the third film that is I guess the third film is not Deadpool 3 though it is X-Force and he doesn't need to be in X-Force I imagine that you know he's a bartender yeah. at a shady ass bar like he doesn't need to be there because he's not a superhero. Nobody in that bar is a superhero except for Deadpool. So take out all the ridiculous antics and ridiculous arrests that this man has. He His character's just not needed. So to me, this isn't really news. Yeah. It's confirming. I mean, I like the comedy that he brings. Right. Obviously, his life choices are not the best. But, uh, you know... I would have been okay with them saying he's in it. Mm-hmm. Maybe he's the bartender at wherever X Force is meeting up. I don't know, but uh, yeah, I mean it. It's fine. Yeah. I'm surprised that they, you know, still kept him in Deadpool too with all the stuff. I guess they had already shot it at the point that all this stuff came out. But right, he's only yeah. had trouble within the last couple months. So. They they probably like, he probably does a lot of ex, uh, exposition, and so they would have had to create a new character to right around that and it would have been expensive and the Deadpool movies have had a tight budget both times around so I'm not shocked I don't really blame them for not jeopardizing the entire film Mm -hmm. Um, but you know it makes sense that he's not going to be an X-Force I I think that if nothing had happened and you know he was just this nice normal guy that they probably would have just come up with a cameo for him in X-Force because that's how movies work now Yeah. but yeah you're right it's not like he has a reason to be there he's just not that necessary in this case so whatever mm-hmm. not the end of the world um also in Marvel news back to Luke Cage yeah oh yeah we skipped over that my bad yeah Luke Cage season 2 trailer dropped and new release date I think this is the first time they've set a release date for it like an official date yeah um, we thought it was going to until 2019 or like late 2018 but it's actually what June it is June 22nd, I think. The trailer looks amazing. I had a lot of fun watching it. Watched it a couple times. So. To be fair, the trailer looked amazing for season one, too. And, uh, <laughs> I loved all of season one. Only the first you six episodes that. were good. The rest well, was... Cottonmouth was great. Diamondback was pretty awful. And Mariah... Mariah was awful. I, I mean, Mariah. I liked Mariah. And she seems to be the big villain in this one, too. So, uh, like, the one She's at least back. kind of in the background. Yeah. Shades is back. I think she'll be around. I don't think she'll be the central antagonist, though. Probably not, but she wasn't the central antagonist in the first season either. I think she's just kind of like a, you know, she's the one puppeteering all all the uh, Mm -hmm. other ones. It looks cool. I really like the poster for this season. uh, Harlem on his back. Yeah. That's really creative. The artwork is really solid on that. I think it looks great. Mm -hmm. You know, it makes me wonder. I, I mean, I know that these take place before Infinity War, but maybe are they ever gonna get to the snap? Like, is that gonna happen? Like, for season four of Daredevil, you know, or something like that? I guess we'll have to wait and see. I would imagine that anything that's gonna release prior to Avengers four takes place before Infinity War. Yeah, probably. Except for maybe Agents of Shield because it's episodic, like released episodically rather than all at once. So yeah, you know, that would be maybe the only question mark. But I also, you know, for anyone who hasn't seen Infinity War yet, I don't want to spoil anything. We already did. So yeah. well, last week, but someone made no. We did it. this week too. You weren't paying attention, apparently. Yeah. What when you talk about Groot's line? Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, we don't... his last line. Yeah. The, yeah, his last line. It, I mean, that doesn't say. Now you're just making it worse. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
All right, all right. Um, any other news related items you guys want to cover? I feel like some Shazam other stuff Gate happened. 2018. Still no picture of the official suit, but Zachary <laughs> Levi was killed by Thanos. That's with, sad. With the website, but what Shazam? Going to. That's we funny. don't know. We don't know. But he posted on Instagram that he got killed by Thanos. Did so. you guys survive? I survived. I, did not. I survived. Oh, I'm I sorry, didn't. Ryan. Yeah, we'll continue the podcast no, you will in not. your honor. My, I would want you to end it. It's <laughs> true, you would. Yeah. Fair enough. Um... Yeah, so I guess then that's probably it for, for any big yeah, news. Yeah, no, well, DC so. has really been pretty quiet lately on the old uh, yeah movie front anyway. So. Nothing nothing really exciting. The, the Batman Ninja movie is out. Yeah, I have still seen that. I need to check so. that out. I do want to give a shout out real quick because I started watching this and it's actually much better than I thought it would be. Cobra Kai? Yes. I've heard have nothing but watched, good things about this. Have you guys watched this. any of it? No. no. Okay, so it's on YouTube Red. The first two episodes you can view for free whether you're on YouTube Red or not, just to kind of see if you like it. I think it's ten episodes. I've watched four, um, and they are really, it's really good. It really, like, the acting is is a little rough in spots, specifically from Johnny. Um, but, but... Uh, it's because Zapka's a pro. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm not kidding. I, I love Zapka. <laughs> I think that, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I think that it's really good for people that watched Karate Kid as a as a kid and now these characters are older and we're all older so it, it kind of feels like you know my life is way different than it was when I watched that first movie Daniel LaRusso's life is way different now too and Johnny Lawrence's life is really uh that's his name right Lawrence I think I think it's Lawrence uh he, his life has changed a lot too obviously and neither one of them is really the good guy uh neither one of them is really the villain it's very at least where I'm at it's pretty ambiguous and I, and I really like that um, so if you haven't checked it out, check out Cobra Kai. At least the first couple episodes, give it a shot. I want to, but I, I want to rewatch the original movie first because I haven't seen it since I was a kid. Well, there's multiple movies, so you should there's watch them all, other than the Hillary Swank one. No, I love that one. And the we one with uh, Jackie Chan and uh, I'm Will cool. Smith's I'm kid. cool with just watching the original one. Uh, th- th- see, I, I don't so, have a pro- as much of a problem with the other ones as everybody else does. I'm not saying but... I have a problem. I'm just saying I want to watch Cobra Kai. But I also want to refresh my memory a bit. They really haven't watch. addressed Mr. Miyagi much, which is kind of weird. I would imagine, no offense, he's probably dead by now. He is dead. So. He died on my birthday like well, seven years ago. I don't mean the ago. actor, oh. I mean the character. Yeah. <laughs> so. the actor, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, they, there was a, like, a brief thing where Daniel was like, I miss him, and that is all you really have gotten. I really hope they do something more than that. I want to know what happened in the universe. Well, maybe it's it's in one of the later episodes. I, I hope know. so. But in any case, it is very good so far. I'm really enjoying it way more than I thought I would. <laughs> so definitely check it out. I, I they are full I, half I hour it. episodes too. So I mean, it's not, I thought it might be shorter episodes on YouTube Red for some mm-hmm. reason, but it's just it's another streaming service is the problem, right? So I just all, all these streaming services have like one show I want to watch, right? Like Stars has. Ash vs. Evil Dead, but not anymore, and American Gods, but almost like every other year, because they take so long in production, right? Um, Showtime has The Chai, which I want to watch. Um, HBO has, uh, obviously, Game of Thrones, and that's about it right now. Um, until and, the Watchmen series. Until comes the out. Watchmen series comes out at some point. And then YouTube Red's got Cobra Kai. It's like, I, I, and CBS All Access has Star Trek, so I have to sign up for half a dozen different services. Yeah. yeah. At least DC and Disney are launching theirs with multiple shows, so at least there's that. Right, like the DC... Okay, we didn't really mention the DC Universe stuff was That's officially... That's true. Yeah, announced. they have they have an official streaming service now. DC uh, Universe. Well, it's not out yet. But, no, but it's announced. And there's several show. The Titans show that everybody's bitch about the pictures of <laughs> is going to be on that Young at Justice. launch, I think. Mm-hmm. Young Justice Season 3. Uh, what are they calling it? Young Justice? There's a subtitle for it. Swamp Thing, which is a big one. Uh, uh, nobody Quinn. saw that one coming. Like, that was, no, that's awesome. Yeah, it's going to be really cool. Um, and it's James Wan is the producer of it. He's also producing Aquaman, but he's mm-hmm. originally a horror director, so um, that is a really good tone for Swamp Thing. And it's actually not... It's Abby, Abby Arcane... The show is about Abby Arcane, and Swamp Thing is like a, you know, her ex, her her boy boyfriend that went missing or something in this case. Outsiders. So, outsiders. Thank you. Yeah, Young Justice Outsiders. So yeah, anyway, yes, yeah. all these shows sound interesting. I will certainly be subscribing to that for at least a month until I can binge all the shows and then stop <laughs> subscribing. Just like you can do with YouTube Red. I know. I, I'm very excited for. 
the DC Universe stuff. And as Ray mentioned, they're doing a Harley Quinn show, and she's going to be voiced by Margot Robbie. Yes. Which is super cool. Uh, I'll be curious to see if that's supposed to be the same Harley that's in the movies. I really hope so. Otherwise, why have Margot do it when... Um, oh, I forget what her... Tara something, right? Real Tara name Strong. is... No, wow. Tara Strong I can remember, but the woman who did it for the Batman and Harley movie. Oh, I don't know. I didn't um, see that. Sor- Sorkin? Or is that the one where no, she rapes no, Nightwing? Not... She did not rape Nightwing. Oh, I don't know. I, I mean, that's just what I heard it on the was, internet. So. I would not say that that scene is 100% consen- consensual. Like, I'm just saying if you were to swip the, switch the sexes in that scene, I think the tone shifts dramatically. Uh, <laughs> that's true, but especially the dialogue... <laughs> I'm like, not saying that, like, if I was Nightwing in that particular moment, would I have been, you know, super bummed out? Probably not, but, you know. You'd probably also wonder why you're a cartoon. I'm good with it. If I, I mean, you know, being a cartoon, is, if I wake up one day I'm a cartoon, that's not the bad news. So. Okay. Come on, cartoon characters get to do cool stuff. Have you ever seen The Mask? Yeah. Alright, good talk. <laughs> anyway... Let's move on to our main topic, which is our favorite practical effects in film. So this does not include TV shows. We might do another episode later with that. And this does not include CGI or animation stuff, but it could include anything from puppetry to costumes to prosthetics and puppetry. I said that, I think. I did not put any costumes in mine. I didn't realize that was a... Well, the, the term costume can be a little a little vague, so um, there may be something on somebody's list that could be considered a costume. I mean, if the puppeteer is completely inside the thing, is that a costume then? No. Okay. What what makes it not a costume then? Because if there's somebody completely inside of it, there's probably people on the outside puppeteering it also. So. Okay, well, we'll talk about that, because in my example, there's no one on the outside, but there's two people on the inside. Okay. So it could be a costume. Ray just keeps looking at me. I don't understand what's happening. She's ready to move forward. All right, let's do this. What's your first one? What's my first one? Yeah, go ahead. All right, we've reached the part of the podcast where I talk about the Wizard of Oz for the next hour. (laughs) Your whole list is nothing but the Wizard of Oz? Yes. Oh, wow, your whole list is nothing but the Wizard of Oz. Yes. Oh, wow. Okay. The Wizard of Oz was made in 1939. There was good year. no computers, <laughs> so um, everything in that t- was practical effects. The uh, there was all kinds of uh, intense things for the prosthesis, for the costumes. But let's go to some of the fun stuff. The scarecrow had an asbestos lining so that his arm could catch fire. Without any harm to him. Little did they know that asbestos was harmful to humans. <laughs> <laughs> Chunks of white gypsum were used as snow in the poppy field scene. Actors were told to hold their breath as much as possible because it is carcinogenic. I can't say that word. But, yeah. Wow. They must have gotten paid well for this. That movie. was the only time that has been used on set. Legally, because <laughs> right after it was banned. Shocking no one. Compressed air and talcum powder was used to simulate smoke coming out of the Tin Man's hat. Elevator platform was built into the floor and lowered the Wicked Witch uh, for both the scene in Munchkinland and the melting scene. The uh, scene in Munchkinland was filmed twice. The first one, she uh, they... You can see the trap floor open and the smoke rise before she is standing on it. So they wanted to shoot it again. She got caught. The fire goes up and her makeup catches on fire. So she was out for three weeks afterwards and they just ended up using the first take. Uh, When she gets back on set, (laughs) the first thing they do is ask her to get onto the motorized broom for the surrender Dorothy scene and she says nope not gonna do it her stunt woman does it and the broom explodes oh my god <laughs> and she spends two weeks in the hospital um they blew up two witches her wow. makeup was toxic it left her green for almost up to a year after the movie was done filming 
and for the entire, uh, I believe she was on set for a total of six weeks, um, she had to be on a liquid diet because if she put any of the food in her mouth and it got on her hands, the makeup got in her mouth, she would have died. Um, a fishing line was used for the, uh, uh, connected to a fishing pole for the Cowardly Lion's Tail. That is still visible even in today's copies. They still haven't edited it out and I kind of appreciate that. They didn't edit it out of the Blu-ray? Mm -mm. Wow, that's surprising. The elevator platform built for the melting Wicked Witch um, was really clever because they they filmed it multiple times, each time with a bigger hat so it looked like she was getting smaller. Wow. Uh... The Let's see here. There was a front projection screen uh, during the crystal ball where Aunt M is on there and it was the only time where the sepia tone film crossed over with a colored film the I don't know what you're talking about that's just what Kansas looks like <laughs> a hypodermic needle uh, spread black ink across the bottom of a glass fish tank that uh, had filled with tinted water so they could get the sky writing scene that said surrender Dorothy uh, a th <laughs> 35 inch Muslin stocking was used to create the funnel-shaped cyclone. They just spun it around and then unspun it really fast multiple times. Fun fact about that, the uh, tornado in Wizard of Oz was so real looking to a lot of people that it had an increase in meteorology right after. Like a lot of people went to school for that. And a giant silver ball was used for uh, Glinda the Good Witch to get around and they just kind of painted it onto the cells afterwards pink. Uh, Jello powder was used for uh, six white horses during the horse of a different color scene. And last but not least, when the Wicked Witch goes after Dorothy's shoes, um, a giant like thing of fire or lightning kind of sparks from it she's not allowed to like grab it and that was three or four takes of them pouring uh, apple juice on it and then they sped up the film really fast so that it looked like the lightning so that is my Wizard of Oz list of really cool effects I did not go through every single wow. fact in the movies and I just, things that I picked. Like, that just, was the most technically made film at that point. I, I mean, chocolate syrup was used for oil, and, I mean, obviously gypsum was used for snow. Like, it was just really creative. It was the most technical movie for about another 10 to 15 years, so it, it, they had to get really creative to do all this stuff, and, you know, I... Directors nowadays don't have to get that creative. They can sit back and be like, computer, computer, computer. So, you know, I, I had a lot of fun figuring out all the fun little parts in this. So that's not my list, my whole oh, list. Okay. I have other films. I just wanted to write down all the things because even as a kid, I was like, that's impressive. How did they do that before they even had, you know, all these things? So well, that's cool. Those are boss. I was really impressed that they got Pink Floyd to come on set. You're too. the worst. <laughs> yeah, it's a little known fact. The worst. <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, you're not. I am. Pink Floyd was not a band in 1939. Also, the, the uh, little guy that committed suicide behind the thing. That's you know, not that's... real either. That is a crane because no, they it's had animals I mean, on the set. It's science. So. It's can't, science. Really, can't really argue science. <laughs> didn't, the, didn't the Tin Man, though, get really sick? He got lung cancer or something? No. So. I thought he did. No. Buddy Epson, who went on to play uh, Jed Clampett in the TV show for uh, Beverly Hillbillies, was originally cast as the Tin Man. They used a white grease paint with an aluminum powder. While he, they were applying it, on the first time, he inhaled so much of that powder that he was... Um, immediately taken to the emergency room. He was incredibly sick for months, and because he was gone so long, they had to recast the part with Jack Haley. So nobody got lung cancer. Jed, or uh, Buddy Epson, was, he made a full recovery, but he was incredibly upset, 
and he believed this cost him his career. Mm. Okay. Crazy stuff. That is crazy stuff. The wonderful Wizard of Oz. We live in Kansas City, so um, that is a big topic of conversation for anybody who's not from Kansas City who talks to somebody from Kansas City. Oh, like the Wizard of Oz. That's how they relate to us. It is, yeah. yeah, That's all they know from us. Or when they're like, hey, I'm from Kansas City. Kansas or Missouri? Well, no, people think it's all in Kansas. Yeah. I usually tell them I'm from Missouri because that's where all the fun stuff is. Kansas. And the meth. Uh, oh my hey, god, so... Topeka has a lot of meth too. You need to back off. <laughs> back up your meth back off your meth accusations, Derek. <laughs> Kansans Please. don't actually uh, include Topeka. Topeka is its own thing. Um, Alright, so Ryan, it's what is what is your first movie? <laughs> well, since Rachel went with her favorite movie, I'm gonna okay. go with mine, and I'm gonna say Ghostbusters. Uh, it has yes. some of the best practical effects um, still to this day that hold up. I think uh, I put a, put a couple specific ones down that I really like. Um, when Sewell's levitating over the bed, um, and Bill Murray is kind of like underneath her and all around behind her looking at her, uh, that was all done practically. It was, uh, there was a rig back behind the uh, uh, curtain, and she had to be in basically a full body cast. To keep her from like bending, <laughs> because humans tend to bend uh, when pressured in the middle. Uh, so that was great. Also, one of the creepiest lines in the movie happens right there when you find out that for some reason uh, Vankman was carrying around a bun- enough Thorazine to knock out somebody on a date. If he was bringing that one. Kind of changes the tone of, of the character. What do you think about that? I think he said Thorazine. I could be wrong. But... As an adult, the movie's a little bit creepier yeah. than I remember it being. Right. Yeah. Um, the, abduction, more subtext. the abduction scene where she's like taken into the closet thing and you can see the hands are like claws kind of pushing through the wall was really cool back then. Uh, and the things ripping up through the chair and grabbing her. Yes. Um, you can clearly see one grab her boob. Uh, yes. Whether it's on purpose or not, I imagine they couldn't see what they were doing when they were doing that scene. And the um, arms look pretty thick. They may not have. A, but you kind of know idea. what a boob right. feels like. Like you could have grabbed and then moved around. Yeah, this yeah. giant, thick, like probably like rubber thing. I doubt. They I don't had. know. It's not like she's really flat chested or anything. Stay Puff was a guy in a suit. Yep. So that's cool. He wasn't made of marshmallow. No, that wasn't real. That's sad. Um, they actually like the scene where Walter Peck gets knocked uh, with, or gets all the marshmallow dropped on him. It was actually a bunch of shaving cream, and it hit him so hard that he actually like gets knocked off his feet because it was so many pounds of shaving cream. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of practical effects in that movie. But suffice it to say, I think that that one is one of the standouts for '80s movies in terms of uh, sheer number of practical effects. How would they do the toaster scene in the second film? Uh, they just have little like. Uh, what are they called? Triggers. Little, like, no, a little, like, gosh, the little things that, like, sh- move. The cylinders that move. Pistons? No, it's like, there's a term for them, but... Uh, pistons. Yeah, I know, well, yeah, okay, sure. Piston is, is a type of whatever I'm thinking of. I don't know what you're talking um, about. But, yeah, just, like, little servo-controlled things that made it pop up. It was, uh, that was a much easier one than, I think, probably a lot of the ones in the original movie. Probably. But probably one of the more iconic ones for kids that grew up in the 80s. Um, I know I remember that scene pretty specifically. I mean, getting yeah. the actual Statue of Liberty to walk down the street. Was crazy. Was really I mean, the crazy. amount of work. Yeah. And then to put it back <laughs> on top of that and clean out all the slime inside of it, it was, yeah, certainly a feat. They at least had to buy her dinner first. That's right. She's from New York. It's true. She's yeah. a harbor chick. She's a harbor chick. Wow. <laughs> Um, all right, so I'm not sure which one of mine to go with first then, but I guess maybe I'll just get the iconic, one of the more iconic ones out of the way, and that is uh, Aliens. So the first Alien movie, of course, has the one xenomorph, which is a uh, person in a suit, and it looks pretty good considering. Uh, and the John Hurt chestburster suit. Yes. That right. is pretty That's, that's pretty much well regarded. One of the most yeah. highly regarded practical effects of all time, yeah. Because it, it freaked out everybody on set, too. <laughs> yeah, because they didn't know it was coming. Right. Yeah, it's a freaky scene. Well, um, actors didn't. Yeah. But uh, I, I think that the sequel kind of outdoes the, the first one from an effects standpoint, and that's mainly with the Xenomorph Queen, which was a giant puppet, 
essentially, that took two people to operate. This is why I was arguing semantics before, because it's not really a costume, but I was just giving Ryan a hard time. Derek um, arguing semantics? I know, right? Never. No! But the, the Xenomorph Queen was actually partly designed by James Cameron, um, and... Um, Oh, what's uh, Stan Winston? Um, they they worked on it together to design this thing, which is just this terrifying, giant robotic puppet that took two people to control, and um, it is one of the coolest looking things in film, in my opinion. And it was made com with all practical effects. The whole thing is real. There's no CGI on top of it or anything like that. Um, and when you you kind of learn what is CGI today, when it doesn't even necessarily need to be. Uh, like Ray and I were talking the other day, I was disappointed to find out that Mantis um, in Guardians yeah, her and her are not they're not real, real yeah. when like in Star Trek the Andorian antennas have been real since Enterprise. So like that was disappointing to learn. Like we did it 15 years ago. Like you can do it. You yeah. Know? Um, so to know that the Xenomorph Queen, which was this gigantic monster, it was absolutely huge. That you know uh, Ripley has to fight in the big mech suit thing, and you know like it's a monster, and it was all real. It all worked. It moved, and it didn't break down anywhere near as much as some of the other ones that we'll probably talk about on this list. Which is why I think it's probably the most impressive single thing made in a movie. And Stan Winston, it's worth saying, is pretty much the hero of uh, him and Rick Baker are pretty much the the like grandfathers of practical effects. Um, at There's least for the 80s Winston movies School and... of Effects and Makeup or something like that. Yeah, they yeah. actually yeah, Stan Winston School is a is a thing now on the internet. You can take classes and. Uh, and learn all kinds of stuff from building costumes to makeup to sculpting, uh, you know, all kinds of crazy stuff. And yeah, those guys are basically almost everybody from newer movies, like 1990 on, were trained by or the right. protege of one of those guys. So, including some of my favorite special effects artists, are worked with those guys, and that's where they learned everything. So yeah, Stan Winston is always going to be up there. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So that that's my first one. Good choice. Thank you. Yeah. I agree. Ray, you're up. Okay. So my next one, I wanted to talk a little bit about Christopher Nolan because even though he does very modern films and he is completely just, it, I don't know, he's always seems one step ahead of some other directors. Uh, he still includes practical effects in every single one of his films. In The Dark Knight, he f literally flipped a semi that was not computers. They uh, got a real semi. Nothing about it was altered in post-production, but they put it on a platform and they literally flipped it so that it would look as if it had run into the cord. It was pretty impressive there. The hallway scene in Inception. Everybody, Such a cool scene. Everybody is always amazed when they find out that it wasn't uh, CGI. They practice it. They choreographed it for weeks. And uh, basically they built the entire hallway as a spinning set. Something that had been done in the 60s with Fred Astaire um, when he was dancing on the ceiling. But this was a much larger scale. The largest that it had ever uh, been created so that once things started getting, you know, trippy in the dream, the set started just spinning and spinning and spinning. And uh, I think Joseph Gordon-Levitt had said he had to practice for weeks on the fight. I can imagine that must yeah. have been tough. Like fight scenes can be difficult to choreograph when you know the world isn't moving. Right. So. And if you're going to be talking about Chris Nolan, then you yeah. got to mention uh, the third Batman movie of his trilogy where they the plane scene was all practical. Mm. Yes. Um, when you see people, like, in the air, that was all real. It was nothing nothing was CG in that. Um, I think that that one is probably even more impressive than than uh, the semi and the, and the right. Inception scene, personally. But um, they, he, he definitely is a big believer in practical effects, which is, I love that. I always love filmmakers that are willing to, you know, or that, that can recognize the difference that practical effects make both in the final product and also to the actors on set mm -hmm. and the results that you get from them being able to interact with something real. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you, when you think about, like, why, at least for me, why I love practical effects is that they look real because they are real. 
right? It was actually there. So when you're talking about sci-fi stuff and the ship models existed, and yeah, of course the the, the Falcon wasn't actually this you know life size when they were filming it necessarily in the old movies. I know they built a pretty big one for the new movies, but well, but the, I mean the corridors that they yeah, were walking the corridors around, are was real. real and, but even like the shots though, when it's you know you've got you know an X-wing going you know against the Death Star and stuff like that, like those things were physical objects that were shot really there you know and so it holds up that way it mm-hmm. holds up a lot better bad cgi does not hold up over time the way practical effects do. when you see the story um uh, from the hobbit i think it was the hobbit movies yes um yeah, where gandalf ian yeah ian mckellen was uh you know cr- crying after a take or something because because he was having to act to a tennis ball and like to multiple not, ones like that was not what he wanted to be doing with his life and well he's a stage actor a Shakespearean yeah. stage actor and so the idea that he'd be alone on a sound stage talking to tennis balls is not what he got into acting to do that's not who he is you know if he's not going to be acting for a live audience he better be acting with live people and the thing is Peter Jackson changed it they used forced perspective for Lord of the Rings and you can see he is talking to actual people for a lot of it. They they did the tennis ball thing for some scenes. There, there was no way around it. But for a lot of it, he is talking to real people while acting. And they got rid of all that every time he was in the room with the hobbits and the dwarves. Yeah, there's a lot of debate among fans about why the hobbit was so much worse the Lord of the Rings, and I'm not sure that practical effects is the is the main reason, but it definitely is it part contributes. of it. it. Yeah, I mean, when you think about the orcs and things from uh, the original Lord of the Rings movie, that was all not all the when you see big groups of them, not the big army or whatever, <laughs> right. but the big groups of them. Those were all people in armor. Mm-hmm. They made so many. Weta Studios made so many swords and so many prosthetics, and each uh, of them were unique. Nothing yeah. was like completely copied and pasted. Right. So. Uh, I mean, it was. It, it's something that really made a difference in the movies, and I think when you watch the movies, you can definitely, mm-hmm. you know, appreciate the difference. When they went and did the orcs and the trolls and whatever else in the Hobbit movies, they were not practical. They were all CG, and you and could really feel that. And it's been, what, four years? Between the first one and the last one? Well, of, I mean, since the, the last the one and right Hobbit. now. Oh, And... Yeah. Lord of the Rings looks better on screen than Hobbit does. Maybe not like the big fight scenes, but no, yeah. no, but the majority of the film. I mean, there's yeah. normal scenes in the Hobbit movies that don't look right. Right. You know, um, and it's not just there's a, a no Hobbit reason problem. why a water scene <laughs> needs to be poorly done nowadays. We've seen, <laughs> we've seen great water scenes. Sure. Like there's, we don't need to go back to the days of Gidget where they're on a surfboard and there's no water anywhere near them. Like, <laughs> right. we don't have to do that. And it's not just, I mean, we're picking on The Hobbit a little bit, but a lot of the times when you're just, you're trying to find the quickest way to get something done, um, you, you have to cut corners with CGI. A good example is the clone troopers in the prequel Star Wars films. When people had to start making those as wearable costumes, they found out that you physically couldn't because the armor pieces in the CGI models went like through their legs because you could do that with CGI. They didn't have to make a, a practical wearable costume. You know, these are things you don't have to think about if it, the whole thing's fake. Right. So, but uh, Ryan, what is your second? Well, I had I had Lord of the Rings on there, but nice. we've already covered that, so I thought that was going to be a, that was a big one. So, um, I'm going to go with uh, a newer movie, not an '80s movie. Um, Starship Troopers. Um, oh, love Starship who did, Troopers. Who that? Phil Tippett, who's also on my list for a couple other things, but um, I don't know if we'll get to it. Um, but the uh, bugs in that movie were all real miniatures or full size. Um, the scenes that I wrote down specifically are like the scene when uh, the what the chick is in the school and there she's going like dissecting the thing and mm-hmm. she's pulling guts and stuff out and the teacher's pulling guts and stuff out that was all you know real gross looking stuff <laughs> and it worked and uh was sickening to watch um i also have the brain bug when the like, oh. thing went into the guy's head that was a giant bug like that was in the actual creature itself that was all practical um and I had the headshot from when they're in the training right. simulation or whatever. The guy takes his helmet off with the live fire and the brains get blown out. That was that was very 80s in terms of the way they did that. But all those effects in that movie 
not all of them. The the actual visual effects don't necessarily hold up, but the practical effects, they all hold up really well. And yeah. I could still watch that movie and enjoy 95% of it to this day. I mean, it's it's a great movie, and the practical effects are really something. Um, and Paul Ver- Verhoeven, I think is how you say his name, he's, he also did a bunch of other, or at least two other movies on my list, um, is the director. And he's he's big-time believer in practical effects, and all his other movies are really well done with practical yeah. effects too so but that one's definitely one that stands out to me yeah when you're doing sci-fi stuff it's hard to do 100 percent practical effects right. you know because they've got the big ships and the weird plasma explosions that the bugs are shooting in the space and you have to have the the gigantic beetle that the dude can ride like some of these things have to be green screened a little bit and stuff but you're right the stuff that's really there is pretty amazing yeah you know like when the the bug um, when it stabs them in the legs right like those arms like those are legit and they're yeah. huge and just it looks awesome i i love that movie yeah it's a great movie yeah. ahead of its time i think um, in terms of the effects yeah. and also the content of the movie all right so um so for my next one i'm, I'm having a hard time deciding what i want to do with these here so i'm going to go with the remake of the fly jeff goldblum um while he has multiple stages of what he looks like all of it is practical effects even the end result fly is a practical stop motion model that they built it's not any type of animation or anything like that it's all completely real there's crazy prosthetics in that movie that make him look absolutely disgusting when his skin is peeling off and he's taking out his fingernails and his teeth uh, all of that was practical all of it looked just that gross to as it, you know <laughs> today as it did then because it was there and don't get me wrong, a big piece of it is Jeff Goldblum's performance. Yeah. He is able to to sell it incredibly well with his mannerisms, the ticks that he gets right. later on in the movie. I mean, it's it I love Jeff Goldblum. It's probably his best performance in my opinion from an acting standpoint, not necessarily my favorite, but he does such an incredible job playing not a human. But you said you haven't seen Earth Crawls Are Easy, right? No, I love Earth Crawls Are oh, Easy. Oh, okay. Yeah. No, that's a great movie. <laughs> okay, I would argue that then. That's, no, that's it's not a great movie. movie. I love Earth Crawls Are Easy. There you go. But that's different. I love Jeff Goldblum. So, like, there are roles of his that I enjoy more than The Fly, but I think The Fly was the hardest job he's had, and I think he did an absolutely incredible job. It is surprising he wasn't nominated for anything at that time, because that, I mean... It's criminal. <laughs> Horror movies weren't really a, a thing that got nominated You're right. back then, unfortunately. Which is disappointing, because from a visual standpoint, I mean, there are very few films that try to do anything like that to even be on the same type of level. You know, there's not a lot of, of movies that can pull off a single character like that. Sure, there's there's some werewolf movies, you know, Werewolf in London and things like that where a person kind of has to transform, but I think this one goes well beyond what anybody else did, especially in the 80s. Yeah. So. Well, my next one is An American Werewolf. Oh, really? <laughs> it's one of the most iconic it's practical effects. It's incredible. Uh, Rick Baker, who was the makeup artist and... Legend. Uh, puppeteer and special effects person on the entire film. Nobody does that nowadays. Your special right. effects person is not your makeup artist nowadays either. It, yeah, you had to be everything back mm-hmm. then. So well, look the, at the credits in these movies now. I mean, Infinity War had like 3,000 people involved. Yeah, there was at least 10 minutes worth of credits at the end of Infinity War. You know, the end of American Werewolf in London, there's about three minutes. So it, there's one song. That makes sense. Uh, everything in there is completely practical. When he is turning into a werewolf and he looks over at his hand, which is probably the most comedic moment <laughs> in the film because everything else is incredibly terrifying, um, and he is watching it grow, they they did that by doing multiple takes and different size of prosthetics, and it it's just incredibly creepy and Rick. Baker was an absolute genius, so the fact that he designed everything, he applied everything, he made it work, and it holds up even, it's, what, 37 years later since that movie has come out, and, like, I I am just as lost in it as I was when I was younger, so, it holds up. For sure. Ryan, you're up. I'm up. Okay. Well, I'm going to go with um, a movie that is Rick Baker's protege, 
um, was the one that was in charge of it. And specifically, I'm going to go with the RoboCop suit. Ooh. Um, and RoboCop is a film. Also, Paul Verhoeven. Um, but uh, in a lot of practical effects in that film. But the RoboCop suit specifically. Uh, and if you've built a costume ever in your life, which probably a lot of people that listen to this haven't, um, you'll know that the logistics of building something like what they did with RoboCop is nuts. And can cosplayers do it nowadays? Sure they can. Absolutely. In the 80s, nothing like that had ever been done. I mean, how close things had to be to his body. Um, ew. And, you know, the things popping out of his body being in his, so cool. being in his quad, you know, his thigh there. And, uh, you know, I mean, there's just a lot of things going on with that suit. Um, and b- him being able to act inside the suit because the movement was a huge part of, of the character. Um, the ED-209 was a practical model. Um, some of it. Some of it was CG. Uh, but, yeah. I mean, it was, that, that whole movie, I think, has some really great practical effects. And that RoboCop suit still blows me away to this day, that it was a practical suit that a dude was wearing. I mean, it's, it's more slim-fitting than most of the Iron Man armors. And most of those are CG. I mean, there That's, are some. Yeah. There are some practical pieces, but but most of the time, when when Tony's in the suit, it's not Tony who's in the suit, right? You know, and he P- Peter Peter Weller was in the suit. Yeah, you know, um, I couldn't have been comfortable. No, I would imagine not. I mean, just even from just movement, seeing where he needed to go with the the helmet on and stuff like that, it must have been incredibly uncomfortable and very oh, yeah. hot and. I, I would I'd be curious to know how long it took him to get in and out of the suit. Oh, I you know I mean, that'd I be can't imagine. Um, that's that's also one of my favorite movies. Um, the the violence it's a gory violent film and like all of the gunshots and you know the gore that happens from that and everything. The like deaths that. there's there's at least one in there that's that's pretty disgusting and that was all practical. All effect practical, too. yeah. Yeah. So I mean, they really they tried to do as much as they could with practical effects. There's there's some stuff in there that they couldn't necessarily and it was, do. And it's it. the worst looking parts of the film. It is. <laughs> You're totally right, but the stuff that was real looks still to this day amazing. Yeah. If you the RoboCop suit, I think, will still hold up against oh, right. any any other suit that you could find today. I mean, it's it's a beautiful piece of work. If you watch that movie on Blu-ray, I mean, it looks pristine like it was made yeah. yesterday from a visual I would standpoint. love to have, like, a display so. of the RoboCop suit. Oh, man, yeah. That'd be yeah. awesome. Absolutely. Derek. All right. Um, so, let's see here. I'm going to go... There's a big one we haven't hit yet. I know. I know. I'm trying to save that one for last. Okay. Okay. Um, but there's just there's so many interesting ones here to go with. So I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go with 2001: A Space Odyssey. Okay. Um, not the most exciting movie ever made. However, from a technical standpoint, one of the most impressive movies for uh, made in science fiction. Uh, all of the all of the ship stuff is practical. The the model of the ship was real. There was no CGI or anything like that for that. Yeah, there's some crazy psychedelic stuff going on towards the end when he sees his baby and all that other st- strange stuff. But the rest of the movie is basically all practical effects. And probably the most impressive moment um, is the jogging sequence early on in the film where he's yeah. jogging. And it's one shot. There's no cuts. There's no pan, pan aways or anything. It is one stable shot of him running around, jogging around the interior of... The ship and the idea, the, the the quote science behind it, is that if you rotate that part of the ship, it creates artificial gravity, so he can run and exercise and walk around. Well, obviously the ship isn't real; it's not actually in space or anything like that. Ruined. It's ruined. The whole thing is ruined. ruined. It's all ruined. <laughs> uh, and of course, he's not actually running up a thing and going upside down or anything like that. But the whole room is real, and it was built to scale on a rig that spun. And so he's essentially jogging in place while, like Inception, the whole room moves underneath of him. And the camera is basically on a rig in front of him that's not attached to the rest of the spinning room so you can get the whole shot. And while you know, like Inception does that incredibly well in the 21st century, this was done in the 70s, yeah. right? Like, this is incredibly huge, the fact that they had to build this gigantic room that he was going to be able to run in, and the whole thing had to move is just incredible. And it looks like it, he's the one moving, you know, the way mm-hmm. it's shot. Um, you know, there's a couple other small things that were done kind of cool in the movie, like the, the floating pen is actually attached to glass, 
Um, it was adhered to a piece of glass that they moved to make it look like the pen was floating because they had no other way to, to handle that. Um, and it works, right? It looks like it's floating, you know, and they were so limited by technology back then that it's even that much more impressive when you watch it. Mm-hmm. So Definitely agree. Yeah, absolutely. So my last one, I'm going to go with uh, George Miller as a director, just like Christopher Nolan. Most of his movies tend to be more practical effects, and CGI is just kind of there in the background. When you strip it away, it doesn't really harm the film at all. Um, he, in fact, hired a real talking pig for Babe, Pig in the City. No. Practical. Yeah. <laughs> um, he, he knew Scooby. There was this whole thing. There was this whole thing. No. He had, he insisted on most everything in Mad Max Fury Road being practical. So the standout is the flamethrower guitar that it would be super easy for even, you know, an art school grad student to create in Photoshop or um, whatever you yeah, kids fire's use. Yeah, fire is a super easy effect. It seems exactly. Like these so the fact that uh, the artist was told, okay, now how do you make it work? Right beforehand, uh, he, he knew he had to figure this out. So um, it's really ingenious that they built a guitar around a flamethrower that they practiced with the uh, actors so that he knew how to set it off without killing himself. and Or anybody else. Or anybody else while on a moving vehicle <laughs> with a ton of amps behind him that were actually working. So, you know, they, they pulled that off. But, yeah, George Miller, all of this stuff is great. But I just wanted to highlight that one spot because it's, it's a really fun spot. Yeah, for, <laughs> for modern movies, that's yeah. definitely one of the cooler practical effects. Absolutely. Ryan. Well, I'm going to go with a big one for me, because I'm hoping big Derek one. is going to cover the other big one. Um, <laughs> oh, he covers big ones. Let's move on. It's a penis joke, guys. Got it. Uh, <laughs> the Dark Crystal, the entire movie, is yeah. one giant practical effect. Um, there's oh, not a film. human in that movie. It's all puppets, uh, all sets built for the movie. Um, there was probably a lot of drugs involved in coming up with the creatures. <laughs> uh, but... It's all done. I mean, the Skeksis in that movie were like 13 people or something that had to operate them. I mean, it was they had a person inside and several people outside operating all the pieces of them. Um, one of my favorites in that movie is the Landstriders because um, they're super creepy looking. Uh, but you, they're actually like a dude hunched over on stilt legs uh, with like a kind of a crane thing to kind of keep them balanced. But the actors... I mean, the people that were inside, I can't imagine. That was probably... I mean, can you imagine for hours being in a rig like that? I mean, I would be very not comfortable, I imagine. The yeah. Return to Oz movie that Disney did had the wheelers, and they did the exact same thing, only they had wheels on their hands and feet. Yeah. So would they just so, push them from off screen? Yes. <laughs> Yeah, but if you haven't seen The Dark Crystal, the Land Striders actually, like, moved, yeah. Yeah. and they had to be able to move, uh, and they moved, like, a very creepy creature, yes. um, and just from a personal favorite, Agra, as far as character design goes, is my favorite character. Uh, because of the character. nipples. Not because of the nipples, I tend to ignore the fact that she had nipples, but I just think that she's an interesting design. She is. Um, the Gartham were cool, too, but again, those suits were... I, I can't imagine that those were, those had to have been super heavy mm -hmm. to wear around. They're just like a full armored beetle, basically. Um, you know, everything in that movie is beautiful and genius level. There's there's a little bit of life everywhere in the world. There's somebody puppeteering this tiny little plant that's moving to you know the thirteen people moving a Skeksy. Um, it, it was it's just incredible and it's an incredible piece of engineering and creativity from an era that is. No more, unfortunately. Although there is the Netflix show supposedly coming out this year that I haven't heard anything out, out about, you know, in a long time. It's been a while. With Henson Studios supports it fully, supposedly. Well, so. pu puppetry is incredibly underrated. Everybody says that they love the Muppets, but you know we don't get to see much more these days. So. Well, I mean, look they don't at tune in to watch them. The Last Jedi. A lot of people, you know, were mixed feelings about Yoda being in that movie, but the actual 
way they did it was the original way with the puppet uh, and the way he moved was beautiful and true to the original um, and which, which is why it was that much more confusing in episode one when he was a puppet and looked all messed right. up because like, yeah. he's always been a puppet right so, like, <laughs> I th- yeah I th- it's they went back to the original way of doing it and yeah. the original style of puppet and and it paid off in the end um, I mean I know we we're, we're not I, I mean, we're probably gonna leave out Star Wars stuff and I have Yoda here, on but mine but Star Wars is talked about all the time I mean yeah. Lu- Lucas we talk about it all the time Lucas art. ILM, Skywalker Sound. I mean, we did entire... talk a little bit about the ships and stuff like that yeah. in Star Wars. So. I mean, it launched an entire industry that companies all over the world still use for their films, right? Because they did amazing things. And the truth is that some of the coolest looking stuff in Star Wars are the puppets and the crazy aliens that were physically there, right? The, the biggest complaints about the special editions are all the weird CGI stuff that was thrown in later. But you go back and you watch the original stuff and you see... Yoda. You see, even in the newer movies, all of the crazy aliens they've started to bring in that are practical effects. Well, one of the big ones that people bring up with Star Wars is Jabba. Uh, I mean, that was a practical creature. I, I would put Yoda above that, personally, but um, Yoda and, or Jabba and Salacious Crumb, his little uh, yeah. quakian monkey lizard that he has uh, at his side, those were real puppets and real, you know, creatures. I mean, so. Jabba's impressive because of his size, but Yoda right. is so intricate with the, the emotions. The nuances of the character. Exactly. Yeah. There, it's a totally different type of skill set, I think, right? Like, building, building a giant rig like Jabba is a very difficult thing in a totally different way than building something as intricate as Yoda is. Well, Star Wars is also pretty great because, you know, cosplayers and builders have helped further it along, you know, the the droids started out with men inside of costumes, and now, you know, thanks to other people, engineers, builders, and our cosplay friends, you know, the droids actually work. Yeah, you have any convention, and there's a a bunch of, a handful of droids from Star Wars, BB units, or R2, or, you know. Well, is a great example, because that's a real droid. I had no idea, when I watched that trailer for the first time, that that was a practical droid. I, I, it looked great, but I had no idea. When they said that, it literally blew my mind, and it took a long time for people to figure out how they did it. It Mm -hmm. took months of, like, cosplayers or builders or whoever it was testing theories and trying to figure out how it worked. But that's... That's what Star Wars was always supposed to do, push the limits of what we could do technologically to make movies. Right. And that was an example of it that they hadn't shown for a very long time. And I think that's why the newer movies look as good as they do. Like the stories, don't like the stories. They look pretty fantastic. Yeah. And a lot of that is because there's so much practical effects being used. I mean, they built the hangars for the X-Wings. They built the Falcon. Yeah. yeah. They had real green nipple milk from an alien <laughs> dribbling down <laughs> Luke Skywalker's mouth. Oh, I just can't beard. get enough of nipples tonight. Oh, man. All right. Oh. So, so you brought up the nipples the last time, so give me a break. Oh, come on. Augur and nipples that go hand in hand. Go uh, nipple in nipple. Nipple. So, okay. <laughs> Nope, not going there. <laughs> You're not going to say it? Do we have any... Okay, so there's... there's. I, I do want to talk a bit about Jurassic Park. Well, you have that's to talk about That's not the big one that I That's not the big one. What's the big one? The thing. So that's on my list, but we ran out of time. That's the big one. When you talk practical effects, that is the pinnacle, probably, of practical effects. I love the thing. But come on, Jurassic Park. But it doesn't hold up as well as some of the other films do. The things it did were things that, that enabled movies to... Uh, do things that they had that couldn't have they thought couldn't have been done. The way things were filmed in that movie, um, the way that the creatures were made. I mean, the, the things were filmed backwards in order to make it seem. I mean, the the head thing that was walking around. So crazy. The dog kennel scene is one of like the highest regarded practical effects in any movie of all time. And I would say that scene still holds up. And it, you know, still. I've mean, seen certain scenes do, but certain scenes don't. It's one of my favorite. No, it does hold up. The T Rex. But that—that's the thing. So I want uh, Jurassic Park. The reason that it kind of if it rounds out my list is the the scope of it all. You know, they had to create these gigantic uh, animatronics for giant monsters. I mean, they make the Xenomorph Queen look kind of small. The T Rex would come alive in the middle of the night and scare us. People on the That's true. Yeah. It was a little more <laughs> successful than Jaws, which would break down all the time. The T Rex was just coming alive whenever it felt like it. Can't quite find the balance there, Spielberg. But um, no, I mean, 
you look at you know the the newer monster movies, right? When they make something like the Jurassic Worlds or King Kong or, or something like that, Godzilla, it's all CGI stuff, and you can tell things are a little bit shiny. It's not quite as you know. There's not Chris as much Pratt's weight to eyes it. Eyes are just a little off. <laughs> but in the in the first in Jurassic Park, it's it, most of it is right there in front of you. The raptors were built. The T Rex was built. The it was a Dilophosaurus, you know, was yeah. built. Like, these were all physical animatronic things. The breathing Triceratops. Oh, yeah. The pile of poop. The pile, P- pile of, poop. of poop. Pile of poop. Yep. <laughs> it's one big pile of shit. <laughs> <laughs> and, I mean, another Jeff Goldblum film, even though he had nothing to do with the practical effects in this one. Um, he just had to sit there and look pretty. <laughs> and, of course, you, you had the, the water, you know, shaking every time the T-Rex came. That, that is such a low-tech practical effect that really had a lot of weight to it though like it doesn't always have to be complicated i think that's one of the things about jurassic park is that it runs the gambit it's got the super simple stuff and the really overly complicated stuff well like spare no expense (laughs) (laughs) oh man that was painful whatever that was an intense genuine belly laugh from you that was I just, you know, have, I just have one argument against Jurassic Park. You don't have to have an argument Kurt against Kurt Russell something. wasn't in it, and <laughs> he was in the thing. But he wasn't responsible for any of the practical effects. In doesn't the matter. It doesn't you brought matter. up Jeff Goldblum. Jeff Goldblum wasn't responsible Only for Only because Jeff Goldblum effects. was on the fly, which I already discussed. It was Whatever. just a connection, okay. that's all. I don't, yeah, well, I have Big Trouble in Little China on my list, too, so... Well, do, do you guys want to talk about some honorable mentions? I didn't really do mine in any order, so I feel like I, we could do just a quick lightning round of things if you have specific I, ones. I have a couple have others on my list. Sure. Let's, yeah. let's hear them. I have okay. one. I really like that scene in Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind where Jim Carrey is playing Baby Joel, and they used like, a very large table, and they filmed the mom uh, out of the shot so that he looked really tiny in his head, but it wasn't CGI. It was just this weird scene of him reverting and they use forced perspective and large props. Hmm. Just fun. Cool. Ryan? Lightning round. Uh, Let's see, we covered those. Uh, The Death Proof Car Chase that actually had a stunt woman hanging off the hood of a car. The arc reactor scene in the original Iron Man when the arc reactor is getting pulled out of his chest and everything, that was all practical. Um, Evil Dead 2 um, with Henrietta and... uh, um, his girlfriend transforming and things like that was really great. Um, the deleted scene from Terminator 2 where they do where he's rebooting with the thing that comes out of his head, but you can still see Arnold Schwarzenegger's face. Mm-hmm. Um, and you, Linda Hamilton actually removing the thing from his head. The way they made that scene is really amazing. Yeah, it's incredible. By the way, so for those who don't know, Linda Hamilton has a twin sister. And she's in that scene uh, because basically the reflections in the mirror are Schwarzenegger and her and one of the, I forget which one's which, Linda Hamilton or Le- her sister. Linda Hamilton's face is shown. and Well, you can see her face both times. Is the, right. is the I can't mm-hmm. remember which one's her. But then they, they had the sister do the other one on a model head of, of Schwarzenegger. That whole movie has some really great practical it effects does. in it also. Yeah. Um, I had, let's see, Johnny Five yeah. as a practical creation was pretty incredible. The things that it was able to do, Total Recall. The scene with the lady's head opening up in the airport and Arnold being inside of it. That's an incredible effect. Also yeah. him when he's in the Mar in Mars with the bug eye thing where his like head is about to <laughs> blow up. Uh and Quato, um, the little oh, yeah. stomach alien guy, very creepy. Um, the labyrinth scene with Michael Motion doing the gravity juggling behind mm-hmm. David Bowie uh, was very cool. Doing that blind, man, that's yeah, it so took crazy. So long. If you ever read the story, it's like <laughs> David Bowie was a saint, according to what Michael Motion <laughs> said, because it took so many takes. He kept dropping it and everything else. Um, Batman Returns, um, the Penguin, which was also Sam Winston mm-hmm. Studios, along with there's a lot of other practical effects in that movie, but Penguin as a creation is probably one of my favorite. And then um, the floating beholder, specifically from Big Trouble in Little China. Um, uh, it's up to that point was the most complicated animatronic creature that they really that they had made. Like it had so many servos and motors and things like that in it. Um, all the eyes would really open and everything like that. Um, it, it's a pretty incredible Steve Johnson, one of my favorite. Uh, special effects artist was the one that created it and he said that it was the bane of his, his existence it was constantly <laughs> breaking down and it was for a very short scene in the movie um, but it was really great and also when the thunder I think it is his head is like blowing up and the steam's coming out of his nose and it's like he's getting bigger and bigger 
also really great scene in that movie. That was a practical effect, but nice. Yeah. Sorry, that was a long list. No, you're good. I've, I've got a few on mine. Uh, so from Star Trek, the motion picture, the V'ger ship that it's on is an absolutely gigantic, intricate model. If you ever watch the collector's edition director's cut, that's like two and a half hours. There's like 20 minutes of them panning this this one ship. Um, so if you've seen Spaceballs and the Spaceball one's really big, that's what they're making fun of. It's just incredible detail. Um, Apollo 13, all of the weightlessness shots in Apollo 13 when they're in the capsule was all done on a capsule that was built inside one of those airplanes that they use for zero G training. So the actors were in a capsule inside of one of those planes to shoot the weightless scene. So there's no fishing wire or anything like that, which that's commitment. Yeah. That must've not been fun to shoot, to shoot all of that. Um, the jaw shark. Uh, to to you know your point right like it broke down all the time yeah and it turned a 54 day shoot into like a 150 some day shoot because it kept breaking down in fact uh, in, in the one scene where you know he's he's feeding he's he's dropping chum off the boat it just like comes up right by his hand they actually had to have divers push it out of the water because it was broken down and they had to get the shot done um, it turns out that the shark was supposed to be in the movie more but because it was so unreliable, they had to cut that back, and right, it actually worked out. Yeah, yeah, it worked out. The Sometimes suspense. less is more, right? Uh, we talked about the thing, which was so on my Independence list, Day? and Independence Day, yes. specifically for the destruction. Um, they built a scale replica model of the White House. Yes. And one of my favorite uh, visual effect scenes in the movie is like the rolling fire that's consuming the town. They slowly like pulled their model and like well it was shot sideways yeah so that way the fire would go up like a fire is supposed to right but then of course they would flip it when they would show it so it looked like it was rolling um the ships were all built even though some of the green screen work is not great but the worst part though with the green screen is boomer the dog Jumping, <laughs> jumping away from, from the it. fire, and that is because, like, I will settle if you have an animal getting away from actual dangerous situations. I will forgive a bad green screen every time. Because <laughs> don't you dare subject that animal to fire. I will kill you. Yeah, that's fair. Uh, I, I more admit there's a in the fighter pilot scene where the fighter jets are fighting the smaller crafts. Um, there's a, a couple of shots where the alien ship kind of like goes in front of the camera, and it's clearly not there with everything else. Um, but the alien that uh, you know uh, tries to kill Brent yeah, Spiner Smith punches. Uh, well, okay, that that's one of them. Yeah, yeah, that's the same. That's the same one, I guess. Earlier in the movie, yeah, that that was all real. It was a giant. He actually suit. punched an alien. He actually punched a real alien. Um, yeah, that guy was a trooper. He's a real champ. He just let him keep going. <laughs> Thirty takes. Uh, so that one makes my list as well. I mean, there's there's just Jeff so... Goldblum again. It is another Jeff Goldblum movie. That's pretty funny. Uh, three Jeff Goldblum films made my list. The scene in Scanners where the heads explode. Uh, so they were. It's basically a meme now. Yeah. Yeah. No. It. They were really well done prosthetics, fake heads that had been built as replicas. They were filled with offal from the O F F A L from the butcher, which is just liver and you know it's all the parts that which we sounds awful. we tend not to eat. And uh, then a guy stood underneath them with a shotgun and blew the shit out of each head as <laughs> it that's gross um on a fun note galaxy quest the big bad guy in galaxy Sarah's, quest so i've it, seen it in real life it's all practical effects and it was so good that star trek ended up ripping it off in enterprise as the reptilian zindi i can so... tell you that like having seen that thing up close it is just as gorgeous up, up close like what about the rock monster, the rock monster. <laughs> also amazing <laughs> looked exactly like real rocks. In fact, it wasn't actually in the display. It was outside. I'm not sure why they left outside. But it was great. They hadn't put it together yet. Right, yeah. Know, just, um, that was CGI. It was pretty bad. Yeah, it was, yeah, it was the rock monster CGI, but uh, Saris is not. And also, he, in that movie, the prosthetic for Dr. Lazarus' head was, mm, was mm-hmm. pretty impressive. Uh, it was. Those large-scale uh, prosthetics like that are not, yeah. not the easiest to do. They're more and more common nowadays, but... The last one on my list is the Borg in Star Trek First Contact. Um, it was a complete redesign of those characters. It basically made a Star Trek horror movie, and they are still creepy. Was the like half queen that yeah. got pulled around? Was that a practical effect? Or so I, it's been a long time since that, I've seen so that. Movie, when, so when her head is being brought down to her body, that is there's some CGI involved there. She's she's wearing all blue underneath. There's actually a behind the scenes shot 
with her and, and uh, Jonathan Frakes because he directed it is, is pretty funny. So that part is CGI, but the actual the suits, all of the stuff that's attached to them, their skin colors and tones, all of that is all real. That's all practical effects stuff. There's a couple shots in the movie where they're building Borg drones and there's like someone who's like part of their arm is missing and their eyes are messed up. Like all of that was practical effects stuff. Um, just, yeah, her coming down from the ceiling onto the body, that part was CGI. That part creeped me out but, when I saw it in theaters, yeah. yeah. Uh, but, like, you know, the way it's, like, pulling on her skin and oh, stuff, yeah. like, that's all makeup work and prosthetic work. Um, you know, when Data gets the, quote, real skin added to him later, that's all practical effects. Um, and uh, it won a visual effects award for that. So I think it's the only Academy Award Star Trek's ever won. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, well, well deserved, in my opinion. Great. So... Um, all right. all right, that's it. So we are over on time. That is a lot of movies. That is a lot of practical effects. We are taking next week off. So we are off next week, and then we will be returning to review Deadpool 2. And then the week after that, Han uh, Solo, uh, Solo, A Star Wars Story. Um, Nailed it. Nailed it. <laughs> Nailed it. Uh, so that, that is our upcoming schedule for the next few weeks. Thank you so much for tuning in. We are the Heroes Podcast Network. No way! We are. You can find us at Heroes Podcasts on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitch, or HeroesPodcasts.com. The show is available on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Blog Talk Radio, and Spreaker. Ryan, where can people find you? Buster Props. Ray? In Kansas City. No. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> you can find me at Siren Ray. And I am the Star Trek Dude. Thank you so much for tuning in. We will catch you guys in a couple of weeks. All right, bye.